Open your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. The Gospel of John, chapter 2. I'm going to read one verse, and that's verse 11 in the Gospel of John, second chapter. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. His disciples believed on him. Now if I understand that verse, the reason Jesus performed this miracle was that it could show forth the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that the way you read that verse? That's the way I read it. The beginning of miracles, of course, that's the first miracle that Jesus ever performed. Been a lot of debate down through the years about Jesus turning the water into wine and that's what happened here. About eight gallons of water was turned into wine and uh, some used that miracle as an excuse to drink alcoholic beverages. I've had them to tell me If Jesus didn't make the water into wine, then why in the world would it be wrong for us to drink wine? I got one answer for that, and just one answer. If Jesus made it, you can drink all of it you want to. But if he didn't make it, you better leave it alone. Best advice that I can give you. Amen. Now, you know this story, but I want to focus on something else rather than just the miracle itself. I want to speak to you on the subject, where's my miracle? Where's my miracle? I believe that we serve a miracle-working God. I believe he can work miracles as much today as he did in Bible times. You don't hear much about miracles done by the Lord this day and time. And I want to tell you why. Man wants to get credit for too many things that God does. He wants the glory heaped up on himself rather than it manifest in the glory of God as did this miracle. There's an interesting story in the book of Judges chapter 6. The Bible says that Israel sinned against God. And because of that sin, God allowed the Midianites, which were their enemy, to overrun them and take over their country and rule them. But the Lord one day appeared to a man by the name of Gideon. Judges chapter 6, and said, Hail thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, That's not me. I come from the smallest tribe of Israel. I come from the smallest family in Israel, and I'm the shortest fella in my family. Can't be talking to me. But the Lord said, I have chosen you. You know the first three words that Gideon said when God told him that? Oh, my Lord. That's probably what I would have said. I'm going to use you, Gideon, to overrun the Midianites. And I'm going to use you, Gideon, to free my people. Gideon didn't understand all of that. And this is what he said. Where be all the miracles that God performed while we were down there in the land of Egypt? 
How come we haven't seen any miracles from the Lord since we left the land of Egypt? They did, but I don't think they recognized them as being miracles. They depended too much on Moses and probably that's the reason they blamed him for a lot of things. It wasn't his fault. So Gideon said, where be all the miracles at? That's a good question for us to ask ourselves today. Where are the miracles? How come we don't see miracles? Where's, where is your miracle and where is my miracle? Don't we need them every once in a while? Wouldn't it be wonderful if God just showered us all the time with miracles? Well, that's not going to happen. It didn't happen to the children of Israel. There's some things that we must do if we're going to see the miracles of God. The first miracle that was ever performed was at a wedding right here in chapter 2. And uh, they ran out of wine. And uh, somebody told Jesus that they ran out of wine. Jesus told them to fill the water pots full of water. And Jesus performed the miracle of turning the water into wine. They couldn't understand that. As a matter of fact, verse 5, his mother said to the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Now, that's the secret to the miracle being performed right here in John chapter 2. It is that they did what Jesus said to do. And I believe if you and I would get back to the place to where you and I would do what God says to do, we'd see miracles in our lives and in our churches as well. Amen. I don't know where I'm going with this message, so... I just got a few thoughts jotted down, so I hope you'll stay with me. The secret in John 2 to having the Lord do that miracle was to do what he said to do. Folks, that still works. You say, preacher, how do I know to do what God says to do? Right here in this book, he tells us what to do. And any time you go contrary to what God says to do, don't expect a miracle to come to your life. It ain't going to happen until you do what he says to do. Turn with me, if you would, please, to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 and verse 54. This again is the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. What a miracle was performed in chapter 4. It is about a fellow that uh, had some real difficulties. The Bible says that when they came, Jesus was back at the same place where he turned the water into wine. There was a nobleman that approached Jesus and said, my son is sick at home. Would you come and touch him? I believe if you just come to my house and touch him or speak over him, I believe he'd be healed. Jesus said, no, that's not what you're after. You're after signs and wonders and if you don't see that, you're not going to believe. And the man begged the Lord in verse 49 for him to come down to his house lest the child die. And Jesus simply looked at him and said, go your way, your son's going to be all right. And the man believed that and went his way. Before he ever got back home, he met the servants coming to bring him the news that everything was going to be all right with his son. The man said, what time did all of this take place? And I love this. Verse 53, they told him 
that it was about the seventh hour and the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, thy son liveth. Now you think about that. A multitude of miles separated them and yet the miracle was performed. The second miracle that Jesus ever performed was to touch somebody through his word and they lived rather than dying. What a miracle that is. You say, well, preacher, what's the secret to that miracle? Glad you asked. Verse 50. Jesus said unto him, go thy way, thy son liveth. Here's the secret. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and he went his way. If we're going to see miracles this day and time and a miracle comes to your life or a miracle comes to my life, I'm going to have to believe the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think you'll agree with me. We need a miracle in this country of ours. I thought this morning about preaching on the subject, White Lives Matter. That'd be a good subject, wouldn't it? I wonder where this so-called preacher that appeared at a black rally was at when all the white Policeman was killed in Dallas. Where was Jesse Jackson at? Where was Al Sharp? I shouldn't get into politics, but I just can't help myself sometimes. i tell you why they didn't show up. Wasn't no money in it for them. That's the reason they didn't show up. I'm here to tell you that all lives matter and they mattered to the Lord Jesus Christ, even a boy that he had never laid eyes on, but his father come seeking help, and his father got the miracle that he wanted because he believed the word of God. And that's where our miracle's going to come from. Chapter 5, verse 9 in John. Chapter 5 and verse 9. Miracle after miracle is found throughout the gospel of John. But in chapter 5 and verse 9, she says this, And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. A man lay on the side of a pool for 38 years, Every once in a while, an angel would come down and trouble the waters. And the first one into the waters was healed of whatever they had. But this man laid there and couldn't get in. He had no man to help him. Everybody there was interested in their own problems. And just year after year went by and he couldn't get any help. But one day there's a master of all masters showed up down there by that pool. His name was Jesus. And he stepped over this one and stepped over that one and came to where that man was laying and said, what is it that I can do for you? And he said, well, I need to get in the pool, but I got no man to help me. He didn't need any man. Right there stood his answer, and right there stood the answer to his problem. And Jesus simply said, do you want to be made whole? Why, of course he did. And Jesus just said, rise up, take up your bed and walk. And that man crawled off of his bed, put it up on his back, and walked off. And they witnessed that great miracle from the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, what's the answer to that miracle? Verse 8, I just quoted it. Jesus said unto him, rise, take up your bed and walk. In order to receive a miracle, that man had to do something himself. He couldn't rely completely upon everybody else when Jesus said, you've been here long enough, get up, take up your bed, walk away with it. That's exactly what the man did. What a miracle it was. 
down by the pool of Bethesda that day. Amen. In order to receive a miracle from the Lord, we need to do something. You just can't sit around and sit back and expect God to do miracles when we don't do anything to receive the miracles. Amen. We read about things happening in other parts of the country. We wonder why it don't happen around us. Maybe it's because we're not doing anything to please the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 9, verse 7. I think you know where I'm going. Chapter 9, verse 7. Jesus said to this man, said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. Now you say, preacher, what's so important about that? Look at verse one. The Bible says in verse one, that man was blind from his birth. That means there had never been a time in his life when he had saw the stars, when he saw the flowers, when he saw the birds that he heard singing, born blind, never to see the face of his mother and never see the face of his father and never see the faces of those behind the voices that were around him, all the living in complete, total darkness. And yet Jesus came by one day and spit on the ground, made mud from the spittle, anointed the blind boy's eyes, and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the Bible said he went. Verse 8 and following tells him that he went. I can see that boy down there as he gets to the pool, dips his hands in the water, sloshes the water on his face, He don't see the first time, but he keeps doing it, keeps doing it until the mud's off and the first thing you know, he's got 20-20 vision. I don't believe God does anything less than perfect vision and that's what God did for this boy. People could not believe it. As a matter of fact, look down at verse 32. Since the world began, Was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? They were witnessing something that the world had never seen, had never witnessed, never heard about, that a boy born blind from his birth had now could see everything that he wanted to see. Can you imagine what a great miracle that was? But listen, I'm here to tell you, there was a time when I was blind. But thank God, now I can see. And it's all by the marvelous grace of God that it came about. God's still a miracle working God. John chapter 11. I don't have to spend a lot of time on this one. Because you know this one. John chapter 11 verse 43 And when he had when when he thus had spoken he cried with a loud voice Lazarus come forth You know the story Jesus had been in the home of Martha Mary and Lazarus a number of times but this time was a little bit different Lazarus had died Martha and Mary couldn't understand why their friend Jesus didn't show up on time when he was sick but waited until he died to show up. But Jesus is always right on time. And When he got down to Martha and Mary's house, they questioned him as to why he didn't come. Jesus just simply said, 
Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be all right. That's my version of the King James Bible. Just show me where you buried him. Four days he'd been in that grave and they said, Lord, by this time he stinks. Jesus can overcome stinks. Thank God for that. And he just stood in front of the place where Lazarus had buried, called his name, and Lazarus walked out wrapped in grave clothes and they said loose him and let him go and there Lazarus stood alive and well and in the next chapter he's sitting at the table with his sisters and others and Jesus eating supper that's a pretty good sign that somebody's alive when they're sitting there eating amen Lazarus come forth you say well preacher how in the world did that miracle took place? It can't be explained by human terms. That is God at work through his son Jesus. I'm here to tell you that Jesus can still perform miracles. Whatever it is in your life that you need, whether it be financial, whether it be in your marriage, whether it be in your individual life, whether it be on your job, God is still a miracle working God can still perform. If God can call people from the dead, he can sure take care of your and my little problems. My miracle began 50 some years ago when I sat on the back seat of a church in Marion, North Carolina, Rocky Pass Free Will Baptist Church. And I sat there on that Easter Sunday morning and I was there just to get my wife off my back. I I was raised in church. But I had seen down through the years so much junk going on in churches it turned me off. Now, folks, that's the truth. And I'm afraid there's a lot of folks that'd still be in church if they hadn't seen so much junk going on and hear so much junk going on. You with me? Now, you amen me a minute ago, but I'm still telling you the truth. Amen. Church is no place for folks to come and have somebody to steal their blessing by their mouth and by what they say or what they do. Amen, preacher. I saw a deacon stand up in church one time in a business meeting and threaten to hit my daddy in the head with a hammer. What that rascal didn't know was my dad had four boys. At that time, we had baseball bats and pitchforks. You remember them old sickles that you used to sling to cut weeds down? We had some of those. And us boys decided he wasn't going to get our daddy so we made us a plan. We lay in the bushes near beside that man's driveway. We knew he worked second shift. We got there. Yeah, I'm, I'm serious. We did this now. We laid there waiting for him to come home from his second shift. We are going to see who's going to hit who in the head with a hammer. And so help me, this is the truth. We didn't realize kind of trouble that we'd got in. We'd had no, we didn't think about that. We're just going to protect our dad. And we was going to do it. I mean, we done made up our mind we wasn't going to back out. We was going to do it. And wouldn't you know, they made that man work an extra shift that night. <laughs> we laid out there in the bushes all night for nothing. We finally decided he wasn't coming home, and we went home. 
We slipped in the house. Mom and Dad was asleep. We slipped in the house. Nobody knew a thing except us four boys. And if either one of us told, the other three going to beat him up. So we kept it to ourselves. So help me, this is the truth. Sitting at the breakfast table the next morning, Dad said, boys, I ain't going to say this but one time. Your daddy can take care of himself. I don't need your help. How in the world he know that? If he'd have told us that ahead of time, we wouldn't have had to lay out in the bushes all night. But somehow he knew. Hey, I saw junk like that that ought never to go on in church. Turn me off. But on that Easter Sunday morning, I forgot all about that. Because the Holy Ghost was knocking on my heart's door. And I thought my chest was going to bust. I stepped out in that aisle and slid into that altar. And that day, I gave my heart and life to the Lord. That was the beginning of my miracle. When I went to Calvary and accepted the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, everything started turning around. I've witnessed a lot of miracles since. And I can't tell you about all of them. And and it's almost time to quit. I was walking through Westgate Mall uh, two years ago, I guess it's been now. I went over to get my wife a gift card let her buy whatever she wanted with a gift card for Mother's Day. Wasn't it Mother's Day? And uh, walking after I got the gift card, I decided, well, they got a sale on some shirts up at one of the stores, Penny or something, and there's a pretty good little ways more I was at, so I took off. I didn't get too far, and I got to feeling real sick. So I sat down on the bench, kind of got to feeling better and walked on a little bit more and my shoulder got to hurting. I reached up to, you know how you do to rub your shoulder and I couldn't feel a thing. I couldn't feel a thing down my arm and my hand. And I got scared. <laughs> Would you? So I sat down again and it passed after a bit and I was almost at the store, so I got up and walked inside the store. When it really hit hard, I thought I was going to throw up all over J.C. Penney's floor. And uh, wasn't no place to sit down. You know, they ought to have chairs all around them stores. So I just pulled some merchandise apart and sat down on one of their shelves where they display clothes. And I thought, well, maybe I ought to call 911. I got my phone out and started to dial and it hit me. I don't want 911 over here working on me in front of everybody in this mall. So I said, my doctor's office is just down the street and I made it to my truck, drove myself to the doctor's office. They said, you need to get to Spartanburg Regional immediately he said I'm going to make a call while you're on your way don't go to admissions go up to the seventh floor room such and such and the doctor be waiting on you there and that's what I did when I got up there this fellow introduced me Dr. Rodak heart surgeon and I said Heart surgeon, do I do I need you? And your family doctor, your family doctor said you did. So he got to asking me some questions, and he said we need to do a heart cath on you. I said when? He said right now. He said the bed's on the outside the door. I said can you wait till my wife gets here? She's on the way. He said, how long will it take? And about that time, my wife walked in the room. 
and uh, he said, kiss her and get on the bed. <laughs> so basically, that's what I did. Dr. Rodak came back after the heart cath was done and said, uh, the artery on the right side of your heart, that main artery, is 100% blocked. And I thought, oh, Lord. But he said, the good news is, some time or the other, that thing has rerouted itself and attached to another artery and you're getting as much blood to your heart as I am to mine and your heart is as healthy as mine. You tell me that God's not a miracle working God? I'll tell you that he is. I said, doctor, is that common? He said, no, it's not common, but it does happen every once in a while. It's happened to this boy. And just recently, I went through some tests and they said, nothing wrong with your heart. That don't mean I can't die in the next few minutes. But if it does, I'm here to tell you that God has worked miracles in this old boy's life and he has your life. I've seen him do it in your life. God's still a miracle working God. But your greatest miracle begins at Calvary when you accept Christ as your Savior. That's the time when God will turn your life around. Aren't you glad that he does? Let's stand across the building.